We've got a couple of speakers. And the first one is Neil Siegel, and he works for Northrop Grumman, and we have a shared uh, history since he's a government contractor, and I spent four years as a government contractor and decided that wasn't something I wanted to do. He is still a government contractor and very inventive, it would appear, so it'd be interesting to hear what he has to say about that. And he's going to talk about closed-loop healthcare processing, the use of proteomics and information technology to improve healthcare. Neil. Thank you very much. Um, if I counted right, I'm the seventh one today, and so we're probably up to about PowerPoint slide 400. So I'm going to try doing this without slides. To, uh, just try to change the tempo here a little bit. My wife will tell you that I'm, I'm perfectly adept at, at talking without any prompts. So, so the first thing you notice is it says in your little booklet there, it says Northrop Grumman, aren't they a defense contractor? Don't they build military airplanes and stuff like that? The answer is we do. We build military airplanes and lots of other stuff. All four human-made spacecraft that have left the solar system were built by us at our facility in California, where I'm based. Um, and that's neat stuff. But we have a very large business that is trying to solve previously unsolved problems, important problems, by looking at data. And about 20 years ago, I started a health informatics business inside the company, thinking that could be another domain where we could bring some of our experience in solving problems with data. And so let me give you, um, you know, so what do you do with data to solve a problem? I mean, some problems, there's lots of different techniques, right? Some problems, it's a signal processing problem. How do you pull very small but interesting signals out of lots of noise? How do you interact with people who make decisions? A very large portion of our business is working with important people who make important decisions. Uh, military commanders, ambulance dispatchers. You know, so how do you present them data, people operating under stress, under time constraints, uh, who are making decisions that will affect human life? How do you give them information to allow them to make consistently better decisions and so on and so forth? But the new angle that I'm going to talk about today is the business of using a little bit of Moore's Law, the advancement in computing power, and a lot of new insight about how to make previously intractable problems more compute tractable, to look at the problem of how do you extract meaningful abstract patterns out of masses and masses and masses of information. Um, this is not search, right? We're all kind of familiar with search. We go to the browser, we type something in, and we get 357,000 hits, which is kind of the same as getting none. And as I always twit my counterpart at Google, you can give me all those answers, but you can't tell me which of them are true. Um, so this is something very different. It's not search because usually the answer, whatever form that takes, does not exist as an atomic entity in the data set. It has to be inferred. It has to be created by discovering relationships and trying hypotheses, just as I imagine that at some level we do. right? Um, I'm, I, I can't compete with the last couple of speakers on, on how that actually works, but, but it is a brain-like process, right? You're trying to create new information from old, right? new lamps for old. And you're doing that by looking at a lot of data and generating hypotheses that seem to establish correlation. I grew up as a mathematician before I became an engineer, right? so at this point we always insert the caution that correlation does not imply causation. Right? So once you find some interesting correlations, then you have to do the hard work to figure out is this just coincidence or is there real causation there? But if you can get that far and find some relationships that you think are true causation, then maybe you have created an approach that allows you to solve some previously unsolved problem. As the, one of our speakers this morning was talking about, this is, one of, this is how you do innovation. right? And so I'll give you an example from a different field, because maybe it'll be a little simpler to talk about a different field, although it uses the word virus. So it's the other virus that we talk about, and that's the computer virus. Everybody's heard of computer virus or, or malware, right? So bad people make pieces of software that get into our computers by lots of ways, not just through the net, but they infect the people who make your printer drivers and, and your electronic picture frames and thumb drives and all that kind of stuff. And there's lots of ways to get these bad pieces of software into our computer systems where they do really terrible things. I mean, computer crime is really 
really bad and really, really big business. Not just privacy, and we know about credit card numbers, amazing amounts of money. Uh, and furthermore, think of all the things in society that are hooked up to computers, traffic signals, right? You, you, the banking system, tra air traffic control system, right? These, this computer malware business is a real problem. Now, so what do we do? Well, we all have Norton antivirus or something like that at home. How does that work? It's very much like what you were describing this morning, right? So there is a, a bit pattern sequence from a known piece of malware. It's basically a bit of the DNA from that computer virus, to use this morning's nomenclature, right? And somebody like Norton has made basically a little database, a list of all these known pieces of computer DNA, and they download that to your computer, and every packet that comes in over the net to your computer is examined against every single thing in that list, okay? And it has all the flaws that she would talk about. That is, those viruses mutate. Now, they don't do it by themselves, right? The people who create them actually build computer programs that make mutant variations of those viruses because they know it will make the problem of detecting them by this stupid mechanical method of looking on the exact bit pattern DNA sequence is very hard. Um, there, there's other problems. You can do the little thought experiment that says you're the bad guy. You write this piece of malware. You release it out to the world. It's going to operate for some time before anybody notices it. Let's say Larry's the first one to notice it. And he reports it to somebody at Norton, who then has to go off and analyze it and create a fix. And on Tuesday is when they release their patches to the world. And typical timeline is about six weeks, when that piece of malware is out in the world complete by itself. And then, by the way, three milliseconds after Norton releases their patches, they release 1,000 variants on it into the world. Right. So this is a hopeless cause. It is as bad. And actually, somewhat analogous, analogies are always tricky, but somewhat analogous to the problem you were describing this morning. So, so the, the signature base, the DNA-based product you're dealing with malware is hopeless, absolutely hopeless. Okay. So what could you maybe do? You could examine millions and millions of computer viruses and try to find some higher level abstraction that would indicate a signature of the presence of malware in a packet. Right? That wouldn't be the specific sets of ones and zeros. That is specific set of things, right? And if you could actually do this gigantic analysis job and you would get some candidate set of signatures, which would be correlation, but not causation, right? Then you would have to do the hard work to see if you could figure out which of those are actual causation. But then maybe you could build a malware detector that would not be trapped into this, you know one virus at a time method that we just walked through doesn't work, right? So we are actually about to do release to the world a, a malware detector that works exactly like that, OK? So these machine learning techniques, that's what we, the people in the computer science world call this stuff, of looking through unbelievable masses of data. You know, those of us who grew up in the world of eight-inch floppy disks, you know, you, you can't even you could fill this room with eight inch floppy disks, right, and not deal with the amount of data that's on your phone today, right? So, but unbelievable amounts of data. We build, we build entire private databases for some of our clients that are the size of the whole internet, right? So you look through very large sets of data um, with these new computational techniques that make all this pattern uh, creation tra computer, computationally tractable. You get correlation that says these signals might be interesting. Then you have to do the hard work to figure out which of them are actually causation. And then you can go off and create a new way to solve a problem. So it actually it works. And I could, I could regale you with lots and lots of examples from lots and lots of domains. I chose that one because it has the word virus in it. And, and, and so. so about 15 years ago, we started um, a business, our first client, big client, was the Center for Disease Control, of doing this kind of processing for really the public health business, not so much for private health care, but CDC, Center for Medicare Services, Veterans Administration, and so on and so forth. And, um, and now we're on a quest to say, can we get into the real health care market that is helping all of us individually using these kinds of techniques? So, so that's 
that's what I'm here to talk about today. Now, so, ah, so what is this? This is health informatics, which to a lot of people in this room probably has a bad taste, right? Because in the last decade or so, there have been tens of billions of dollars spent on health informatics for one purpose, that is to drive down or at least bend over the increase in the cost of health care in the United States. And there's study after study, and of course all of our daily experience correlates with that, but that might not be causation, but correlates with that that in fact it has failed miserably. So uh, there's a, I'm a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and so there's a study that they put out a couple years ago um, that actually kind of goes through the ages and says, you know, these techniques have failed to bend the cost curve over, much less decrease the cost of healthcare. They might have had some teeny little marginal improvement in health outcomes, but that's not why people put all this money into it, right? So, so my view is a new insight is needed, right? A, a new innovation how to do this is needed. And fortunately, the healthcare world is changing, right? So it used to be, I mean, how do we pick what market domains, what problem domains do we want to bring these techniques to? Well, the first thing I need is I need something that is measured. I need something that is measured, right? Because I, I need to have data, right? So we grew up doing this in the business of collecting um, signals from um, radio frequency-based devices, radars and other sorts of uh, space radars, you know, measuring things from the planets at first and then measuring things on Earth and so on and so forth. So that was kind of a signal processing problem. Um, so you have to have something that's measured. And of course, in the last N years, a lot of things are suddenly start to be measurable in the healthcare domain, right? So the, the sequencing of the genome, the work that Larry and his team and other people here are doing on, on proteomics and the whole, all the other omics and so on. So, so suddenly there's data, and there's a lot of data. Right? And that data are correlatable with data that may seem to have no relationship whatsoever to that. And I'll, like, I'll give you some, an example or two when I get to a little story I'm going to tell in a moment. And if you could put all that data together, maybe we could find some signals of interest right, that we could actually then hand over to the clinicians who, would, who do the hard work that would say, oh, there's actual real causation here. And we could do something really amazing. So let me describe the model that Larry and his team and I and my team have been working on. So the parts that you like, you can credit to, the, to Larry. And the, and the parts that, that you scratch your head about, you can blame on, on me and my team. So, so imagine a world where, you know, when you go to CVS, once or twice a year, they'll tap you on the shoulder when you're checking out. And they'll say, by the way, it's time for you to go give your drop of blood. And so you go over with no appointment to this booth over here, and they do the pinprick, no phlebotomist, right? And they take your drop of blood, and they, you put your, maybe your thumbprint on, on the glass so that they know it's you, and, and that's it, right? And they go off, and, and you know, Larry's guys go off and sequence the 10,000 proteins, and somebody else measures whatever else omically can be derived from that knowledge. And that just goes, we do that once every six months for you. Catch you when you come through CVS or Walmart or, or, the, or the, the movie theater. I don't know what, right? You know, it's just a pinprick, right? And then what we're doing is we're building a longitudinal time history of a bunch of information about you, right? And then basically you can imagine that if we could develop what I like to call causality cases, right? That's these these combination of signals that you can extract from data that, you know, this protein is up and this protein is down and this other thing is doing this. That means, you know, you're going to have, you're, you have a high probability of developing X, Y, Z within N months. We can actually already, or Larry's people and some of my people can already do that today for a small number of cases. So imagine a world where all of you and all of your colleagues have generated thousands of such causality cases. Right? And we've got some kind of structure where this works. Right? So, so we, you, you do your blood test once or twice a year. The data goes into some database that is encrypted and secure and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that part in a moment because that's really hard. And, and, and we all have a lot of reason to distrust that part. Right? Um, and basically, we mail you a postcard when you need to go see the doctor, right? When some signal, I say a postcard, you're all laughing at me, right? So, so we send you an email. <laughs> so, but you know, 
we all get 100 emails a day, and we ignore most of that, right? So, so, so we have to do something better than just sending an email. Um, but, but we tap you on the shoulder when it's time for you to go to the doctor. You get to the doctor. They now have that whole longitude time history of all that chemistry that made the computer wake you up, right? They, by the way, can correlate it with all your family histories. They can correlate it with various geographic things. Maybe it's something that's being caused by the air filter in your building. So they can correlate it with people that have the same work address. I, I did an academy study 10 years or so ago where we were asked to diagnose uh, after action report on what they thought originally was a bioterrorism incident in Minneapolis. Hundreds of people died. Turned out that it wasn't bioterrorism, it was a maintenance event, maintenance problem at a water treatment plant. And, and, and it took months for the public health system to actually see this trend and force somebody to go off and look for this problem, okay? And you know, we did all kinds of, uh, we had the advantage of doing it after the fact, right? And we knew ground truth, but, but you know, we did interesting things like we looked into pharmacy records for over the sale over-the-counter sales of caropectate, right? We saw huge spikes. We, if we had done the kind of thing that I'm describing, we would have caught this weeks and weeks and weeks before the existing public, the real public health system did. We would have saved a lot of lives. And that's just one teeny little incident, right? So you get to the doctor. They've got all the information. They have your time history. I, I grew up as a mathematician, right? So I'm always really sensitive to the issue of false alarm rates on tests. And, and making bad decisions off a single test, right? So you have a longitude time history, which allows you to take out a lot of the, the, the false alarm rate errors out of the data. M much better signals, much better decision making. We're not substituting computer decision making for that of doctors. I, I get that a lot. You know, I built systems for, for war fighters, and, and I had generals grabbing me by the scruff of the neck saying, you can't do what I can do. And I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to run your brigade or whatever. I'm just trying to give you better information. Same thing, we build ambulance dispatch systems, police dispatch systems. You know, These are very, very complicated things. Just to give you an example of how complicated some of these simple sounding things can be if you want them to be good in the real world. So we build the ambulance dispatch system for the city of London. Seven million people in a very small place. Okay, We had to go live before the Olympics a couple of years ago. Um, the biggest problem with ambulance dispatch in London is traffic, right? They have seven sizes of ambulances in London, and the main criteria that they use to decide which one they're going to dispatch is how fast can they actually, in the real world, get it there. And there's a whole fleet of medics on bicycles for just for the reason of dealing with the fact. So, so we... We do all the dispatch. We do all the route planning. We do synchronization with the police to try to clear traffic signals, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Real-time monitoring of the 911 call to the ambulance driver and the guy on the scene. London is way ahead of any city in the US, right? Um, but just think about all the possibilities that when you bring all this data together, right? So we would not only bring all this, this omics data together, we could mine pharmacy sales records, as I indicated. We could correlate with building maintenance records, as I indicated. We could do lots of things, right? And the result would be better decision making. You know, one of people that Larry introduced me to is David Lawrence, who's, who's kind of your, your godfather here, but unfortunately isn't here this, this time. And he sat me down once, and he said, one of the seminal problems with health IT today is that all the information are generated for the healthcare practitioners. And us poor patients get practically nothing. And he says the cardinal decision is when do we decide to seek treatment from the sick care system? And how do we do it? We probably have one piece of objective data, which is our temperature. Some of you are really sophisticated and also take your blood, temp blood pressure even if you don't really know what it means, right? And the rest of it is how we feel. Right? Or how we're making our wife feel. Um, and so you know, David encouraged us to think about how could we actually, I mean, there's huge social problems, right? You can give people data, but they don't always make good decisions. But, but over time, maybe you can train people to do things better and more sensitively. But you can imagine the huge, I'm a systems engineer, 
right? So this idea of looking for the high leverage point, this business of getting us as healthcare consumers to make better decisions about when to seek sick care. What a revolution that would be if we could get that right. So, so that's what I, we're talking about is this kind of, I, I called it a closed loop process, kind of a, analogous to the sort of sensor systems we build for all these other customers I was describing, right? So you've got sensors, right? You create these signals. You've got a database of these known signal combinations that you're looking for. In this case, these causality cases, right? You trigger something. You normalize over your longitudinal time history and the other things so that you eliminate false alarms and so on and so forth. And then you send the consumer a postcard. They get to the doctor. The doctor on the first visit has all that information. OK. Now, so let's imagine that I described two things. I described these amazing set of sensors, right? And I described this amazing bit of IT that would First of all, figure out what these signals should be, and then would actually, in real time, as you know, figure it out. 300 million people in the country, two, two, two chemistry events a year, 600 million records, 600 million chemistry events per year, you know, 300 days a year, two million a day. I mean, big data, big data. Um, okay, if that all worked perfectly, let's hypothesize that all worked perfectly. Then we have two other material sorts of problems. There's a whole bunch of Computer science and system engineering problems, right? There's the problem of scale. I always talk about scale because in engineering, scale is very often a problem. Something you can do well with four people does not work well with 400,000 people, right? There are huge nonlinearities in the friction, right? And so in computer science, scale is a huge issue. Um, privacy is another huge issue. Um, interestingly, though, there's lots of ways that are beginning to emerge that I think can get at the privacy problem. I'll just mention one of them to give you an idea of how far out some of these techniques are. Um, so think of kind of the canonical privacy problem. You're with the FBI. You've got a list of 20 known terrorists. And you think that some or all of them spent some time in Las Vegas last month. So you go to the operators of all the big hotel casinos in Las Vegas and say, I've got this list of 20 people. Please, I'd like to go through all your computer records and see if any of them stayed in your hotel and what nights they were here and what phone calls they made. And, and you guys say, OK, give me the list of 20 names. We'll be good citizens. We'll run it for you. And the FBI says, you can't see this list of names. Right? And, and, and hopefully, I hope that you all will then turn to the FBI and say, but you can't have my whole database. I'm willing to give you the records that correspond to the, the real people of interest, but I can't, you know, I, I can't be, I'm not responsible if I let you have everything. That, by the way, was a real situation a few years ago. Uh, and unfortunately, the hotels in Las Vegas caved, right? Um, and gave the FBI access to everything. So, so there's a technique. It's not quite ready for prime time, but it's getting there that we call homomorphic encryption. So uh, unfortunately, I, I apologize. I'm going to speak like a mathematician for a few moments, right? So an encryption is basically a mathematical transformation, right? You take a, a set of stuff, a, you know, a sequence of letters, and you go through a transformation to some other sequence of letters. And it's done in kind of a sophisticated way that it's, you know, you didn't replace A by B and B by C, right, or something like that. Um, or uppercase by lowercase. It, it's more complicated. Um, but it's fundamentally a transformation. So a homomorphic transformation is a transformation that preserves certain properties. Okay? And if you could actually build an encryption algorithm that satisfies certain issues about strength of the encryption, but is actually a homomorphism, and you designed it right, one of the properties that could be preserved is something that over here matches a, a search criteria in the unencrypted space will also match a search criteria in the encrypted space. And then the FBI could just give you all the encrypted list, and you would run it against your encrypted database. It's not like it's going to be decrypted inside the machine. Nothing is ever decrypted. What comes out at the end is the list of hits encrypted, which you then decrypt and hand back to the FBI. We are about this far away from this being a reality. So, so I just give you, you know, there's other techniques, but giving you an idea that some of these privacy problems
can be solved. So now you've got all these computer science problems that you have to do. And then the hardest problems of all. So I'm a system engineer. I build a lot of big, complicated automation systems for mostly government customers um, in the US and other places. I lived in the UK for two years, um, building systems for them. And the hardest problems are not the technical ones. The hardest problems are the social ones, right? Every time you build something that's really radically better, there's always some group of people whose ox is being gored, right? Um, if, if the automobile were being invented new for the first time today, you can imagine the buggy whip makers and the horse ostlers would form a big lobby in Washington, right, and, and would try hard to squash the car or make sure that it only got, you could, you could have a car, but it had to have square tires. Or, or you know, or, I mean, this is the government, right? You, you could imagine this. Um, and, you know, we, we throw around numbers. You know, uh, the healthcare in the United States is 18% of GDP, and most other industrialized countries, it's 10 or 11%. So we should find a way to cut 7% of GDP spend from healthcare. Do you have any idea what that means in terms of oxes being gored? How many millions of jobs literally must go away to do that? Right? So whenever you create a new capability like this, there's a bunch of people and whose oxes are going to be gored. And, you, and, and what I've learned by building systems is if in the end you don't get social acceptance, you're not done either, right? And, as, and, and it's not good enough for us as scientists and engineers to only be concerned with the technical problems because nobody will turn it on. You know, our life's work is useless, right? So we have to, in, in, so, even, so we have to solve the sensor problems, and there's a lot of you in the room that are probably working in that space and making amazing results. We have to solve this problem of being able to look at these massive sets of data Right? and find the real correlations, these higher level abstractions, and then do the hard work to figure out which of them are actually causality. And then we could build a system with all, but then we have to face all these computer science sorts of things, the encryption problem, the privacy problem, um, the availability problem, a system like this must be up all the time. Um, it must be usable by mere mortals. Right? Um, it must have response times that the People using it can tolerate. You know, the, the uh, Affordable Care Act website rollout kind of shows that it's not obvious that this happens automatically. And what we're talking about is a much, you know, or two orders of magnitude harder problem than that. Um, and then if we solve all those computer science problems, then we have to solve the problems of social acceptance of how do we make the transition from the old world to the new world, right? But I think you can see that something like this, and it might not unfold exactly the way I'm describing it, would actually have a chance to do what um, Larry calls you know, the, 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 the goal right, of, of improving healthcare outcomes while simultaneously materially decreasing costs. Right? So that's what I mean by the closed loop uh, healthcare system. I'd be glad to take any questions. And I did it with no charts. <laughs> Excellent job. Where you go? Here, have this one. Extremely complex problem. And the last three minutes of your talk were very illustrative of the number of unsolved problems we have to solve. When do you expect a first proof of principle in a disease area or a health area in a population in a zip code with a known causality? Yeah. So it's, it's a great question. And actually, the question kind of has an, it, some assumptions in it that I'm going to back away from, OK? Because I think I, I kind of stand outside the healthcare system, right? I, I'm a system engineer and an informatics guy but, and a military systems engineer. And I'm not really a healthcare wonk, despite this $500 million of business we do every year in that business. It's, it's still only 10% of the business I do. Um, but what I see when I stand, in, stand kind of outside and look at it is I see a healthcare system today that is kind of oriented around single purpose tests. You go to the doctor, he or she makes an educated guess about what's wrong, orders a blood test. 
They draw a vial or two of blood and they test for one thing, right? If they got it right, you get a, you get a positive result and they can prescribe a course of treatment. We'll ignore the whole business of false positives and false negatives on those tests, right? If they got it wrong, you start all over again, right? So I think that actually the biggest win in the thing I just described is that you get away from that. Unfortunately, that's where a lot of the oxes that get gored are too, right? Because there's lots and lots of money in, in the business of single test, single diagnostic testing. So the big thing, I think, that will really get people excited and energized about trying to solve these problems is the promise of delivering on this multifunction test. And it doesn't have to be, you know, everything. So I look at what I call kind of the closed healthcare systems. The people like Kaiser or, or DOD TRICARE who have kind of made a commitment that for some fixed amount of money, I'm going to deal with whatever's ailing you, right? Because they're the ones who actually have a financial incentive aligned to potentially disrupt what they're doing to save money, right? All the people who are out there in the fee-for-service world, they're the ones who I think are going to drag their heels. So I think that this will... We have to get to, you know, we still have a bunch more science and engineering to do, but we get to the point where some finite closed healthcare system, whether it's, you know, one Kaiser hospital or one bit of the VA or, or we've been talking to a, a hospital in London or something like that, um, I think that that's where you'll first see it hit the ground in something that looks like what I described. Because I think There'll obviously be a lot of experimenting and calibration on one, first on one kind of test, and then on three kinds of tests, and then on six kinds of tests as we scale up, right? But something that will begin to look what, like what I described, I think will happen in one of these closed healthcare systems that have the right financial incentive. Great question. One question there. I, I want to make a comment. I, I am a physician from the Mayo Clinic, and I began transplantation and dialysis early in the 70s. A good example of what you were talking about is the fact that patients can do a better job than physicians at taking care of themselves. Oh, certainly yeah. that, yeah. Two examples. One technical, highly technical in some ways for an individual, which is dialysis. When dialysis began at Mayo, it was in order to be able to de uh, deliver it to um, Farmers, they had to be taught, and we developed what it was, the home dialysis program, very early on. It turns out that they did a better job that, that centers did. And this is a complex problem, yet they were able to do it. And they were able to regulate their dialysis better than the physicians would. But interests, of course, uh, prevented from that program for ex from expanding. The other simple example is control of hypertension, blood pressure. If the patient is in charge of controlling his own blood pressure, he will do a better job than it is done by physicians or other yeah. individuals. So, 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 so these are great examples. If, if Dr. Lawrence were here, he would say that actually in his view, the, abil the idea of using a system like this to get us, the patients, involved in the wellness side, which is Right? We don't, as a society, we don't do this very well yet, right? is even the biggest opportunity here. Because, of course, at any given time, right, if you partition the population of the United States into two populations, right, those sick and those well, most of us would fall into the more or less reasonably well category. But there's lots and lots of discretionary things that we can do or not do to help us stay there. Right? And some of us are not so good about that kind of stuff. Right? And this kind of involvement might be the organization and, and the mechanism through which we could really energize the wellness side of the system, not just the sick care side of the system. Great insight. Thank you. Well, one, one last question for this speaker. So, so one of the advantages of leaving up to the patient, though, to go to the doctor is that the patient is then responsible for, for, for their health care because they think, well, I feel bad, I'm going to go. If you develop a... America's quite a litigious country, right? So if you, if you put the, develop a good algorithm for spotting problems, how do you avoid the algorithm becoming responsible for not picking things up? Yeah, so, so it's, it's a good question. 
Um, there's lots of things that we do that were litigation problems when they started, right? I'm not old enough to remember, and probably none of us are, but there was a time when elevators were not considered safe and reliable enough to be operated by consumers, and there was a special operator in the elevator, right? And, and, and you know, and if we had made that transition today instead of 100 years ago, I'm sure there would be tons of litigation about it, right? And, and you've all read about Google and BMW and Mercedes and, and their, un, their op automatic cars, no driver, right? We, we do it too. We do it off-road for military use. Um, you know, I'm here to report that within most of our lifetime, that will be safer than having us behind the wheel. Absolutely. No ifs, ands, or buts. By the way, airplanes first. Air is a very uncrowded and uncluttered environment, right? The ground is a little more challenging. But within our lifetime, I think, by the way, today, airplanes would be better off. Every major hull loss accident in the last 30 years has been ascribed to pilot error. Um, you know, we build completely autonomous airplanes. We did a, a la landing on a moving aircraft carrier last year. We hit within four inches of the spot we were aiming for on the aircraft carrier. Um, no, with a drone, no person involved, no, no remote pilot, computer flying the thing entirely. Um, cars in our lifetime, in most of our lifetime, cars will be safer it will solve the traffic problem because they'll be able to be closer together. We won't have to build more roads to accommodate more cars. Um, and it will be unbelievably more fuel efficient because we'll be able to manage away, you know, the time spent in idling and the time speeding up and slowing down and so on and so forth. But what's going to stop it? You know, let, let's arbitrarily say that it will be ready in five years or seven years. It may or may not be. But Something like that. It won't be the norm in five or seven years because of litigation, right? But, but the benefits are there, and I believe, I hope, call me an optimist, right, that, that we will find a way to work past that. And we'll, I think we'll find a way to work past that in the thing I was describing to you. Thank you very much. Being a guy that likes driving fast cars, I find that prospect awful. <laughs> <laughs>